Yeah. Paul Rouse, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Jared. How are you? I'm good. I, um, Michael D. Higgins has a, a long range to understand and appreciate exactly the impact that Charlton had. And I think um, that notion of class is really, really interesting because I'm interested to hear, I, you know, I've heard you speak about class before in Irish society and the stratification of Irish society and how sport has, has reflected that. What impact did Charlton's football team have on how football was perceived at a, a class level in Ireland and what impact did it have on class in Ireland? So uh, I would take a step back and I wouldn't entirely agree with what Michael D. Higgins said um, there when, and when it comes to class. There, there is a truth in what he says, but it's not a full truth. So, for example, it is it is not true that soccer has historically been the preserve of working class. It has been dominated by working class people in Dublin, but it has not been the preserve of them. For example, uh, the Irish universities have had an, a soccer competition which extends back over 100 years. It is the one All-Ireland soccer competition that survived partition. And so there's an example of sport which or soccer which reaches well beyond working class because, because as we know, the Irish universities were dominated until the 1960s and that well, well into the 1970s indeed by the Irish middle classes. And it is a much more recent flowering, the fact that it is that the universities have become uh, an opening house for, for people from working class backgrounds. So you have to be very careful here not to to kind of create to uh, a, a, a kind of a history that lacks in, in comple a complexity because it is also the fact that the Football Association of Ireland or the Football Association of the Irish Free State was recognised by the Irish government, the newly formed Irish government after 1922, and it was supported in its idea that it should represent Ireland in the Olympic Games in, in, in 1924. So it's, it's a really, it, it, it's a complex story and it doesn't lend itself to, to easy divides across Irish society. I, it feels kind of true in a way. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the right way to access that feeling is that like um, this is a period of time where you have Roddy Doyle chronicling what it's like to live in the 80s in Ireland in the Barrytown trilogy and for the first time that I can remember in popular culture in a way that transcends its own small group that you're writing about or, or speaking to um, that we get a representation of, maybe that's wrong too, maybe, maybe there was good working class, maybe Bracken actually and all that kind of stuff was about the working class. I don't know enough about TV. Well, you have to look at, you have, well, you also have to look at Brendan Behan's writings and, and all of that. So it's, you have to be very careful again about that. Roddy Doyle's books are amazing books and they capture a very particular period of time. It's, it's an amazing thing actually to look at the films of those books as well. Like you look at the commitments and um, look at the transformation of the Dublin shown in the commitments of the late 1980s uh, and uh, like there's a whole load of people I recognize people in the film from being in UCD at the time who went as extras onto that film and the, the Dublin of that period was entirely different than the Dublin now in terms of representation look at Smithfield for example the square in Smithfield as it appears in that film compared to to to, to how it is now and um, so now I'm not trying to say here that soccer wasn't dominated by working class people or that or that Italian 90 wasn't a great celebration, or at least in part of that, and an opening out of soccer to people who were not previously interested. I'm not trying to say that at all. I'm just trying to try to say that that story can be overdone. Is there, is there an aspect though, in, in, and again, I'm just trying to tease this out, right? Is, there, is it about celebrating that in a way and, and giving voice to that culture in a way that hadn't happened before? And even with Behan, is there not a little bit of Behan being a little bit of um, uh, the the upper class were like, oh, here's here's the here's the monkey representing, here's the the paid trained, here's our kind of cage. We're we're tourists, and this is our way in to be class tourists, like the pulp song. That like, yeah, but again, yeah, well, the common people idea. Yeah, like this, this is um, there's the truth in that as well. But again. How did people perceive it at 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 the time? I people perceived it. People perceived it at the time, and and this is where again I suppose that there's there's an age difference here. And like 1988, uh, I mean I was 18 and just going to Dublin. 1990, 
um, and between Dublin and Tullamore. And it's it was an incredible time in a sporting sense. And I'm not too sure that there was a huge amount of reflection at the time amongst the decisions why people were doing things. I think people were just absolutely carried away with the idea that this was a sporting team that was actually enjoying success and a success that had been denied previously. And like, if you look at, look at say, qualification for the 82 World Cup, which Northern Ireland made, and there was a huge support for Northern Ireland down, the, down across the south of Ireland um, as, as well, and that really captured the imagination. But the fact is that the Republic of Ireland were incredibly unlucky not to make those finals really incredibly lucky not to do it. And there was a huge national disappointment that they hadn't done it. And so on back, the near misses across, since the 1930s, actually, the near misses in qualification. And this was finally qualification for the World Cup. And that qualification itself in 1990 was a huge statement. Qualification for the European Championships, obviously, in 88. But qualifying for the World Cup was a huge statement. So maybe at its roots, the World Cup is so big and so important and it's in the way it's, it's kind of the end of an underdog story in, in some respects is that although we're still the underdogs the whole way there it's no longer the feeling that we're it's Anthony Daly standing there saying we're, we're no longer the whipping boys we, we have a, a place at the table is is it as simple as that at its root that actually we finally reached a promised land and here's what it's like I think it's I think it's as simple as that for some people. For other people, it meant for p different people, things mean different things, and you have to be really careful about ascribing motivations to people as to how they felt and why they felt, and did they feel the same now about it as they did at the time? And again, I know this is a pedantic, boring, academic way of looking at it, but you have to be careful about about casting back motivations onto yeah. people and telling people how they felt and how they should have felt. What I do know is that it was an incredible party for a month. And if people began to dream that we actually could go, but by the time the quarterfinals came around, the sense was, do you know what? There's no real great team in this competition. Yeah. This could keep going. And there is that tinge of regret about the, the, the quarterfinal. And you can hear it when Mick McCarthy speaks about it. They were really close to winning that match, really close to it. Um, I'm going to blame you though for the fact that um, I'm trying to ascribe stuff because you, you quoted Nulo Fuelan in your piece uh, yesterday yes. in the Examiner and um, I, it rang a lot of bells for me about what we've just come through right now where there was this short period where uh, there was a, a great national togetherness as we were all in lockdown and all kind of wondering well what's going to happen next and is there a possibility for us to somehow use this time to reshape what's coming next and, and I think maybe we, we've, we've missed a lot of those opportunities um, just even in terms of traffic and all that kind of stuff and who knows but um, that, that, what she was obviously feeling that at the time that there was enough people around going this is something a bit strange here there's a there's a national outpouring of togetherness that we haven't seen before and, and maybe that's just because sport has that power I don't know but it's not just sport that has that power. And I'll, I, I'll give you a different example. Um, in England, everyone said that England would never be the same again after the Lady Diana or Princess Diana uh, outpouring of grief and emotion around that particular time. And I'm not, again, nothing is ever the same again. Like things, history changes and times move on. And there is no doubt that the Irish sporting world was never the same again after this but in terms of how people um behave towards each other i think that the, the, I, I think it is in the memory of that event and in the nostalgia around it but also in the kind of culture that was created in it the stories around it and the aspiration to fulfill it again and look at look at what happened 94 the, the 1994 world cup was a pale imitation of that experience even though ireland actually went and won a match in the field of play, beating Italy. There was a great fun around that. It was really good fun uh, on that particular evening. But by the time the team had departed that competition, the national mood had shifted a little bit. It, it, it wasn't like, look at the numbers who turned up to the homecoming in 94. They were way smaller than, than 1990. And by 2002, we were really ready for the row. I mean, we'd, we'd, we're kind of got, it was like we, it was like we kind of got bored of this thing of, of actually uh, making it to a competition. 
and and competing to a decent level in that competition. So now we needed something, throw a little bit more salt in, into the pot. Have you been chasing that nostalgic idea of Italian 90 ever since then, that when you do have a moment that isn't even in a tournament, like say for Shane Long's goal against Germany, as important as it was, there is this national tendency to go Italian 90 levels of crazy if possible. Well, there's 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 the it's it's like the I went to see Crystal Palace playing about twenty years ago, um, and they had a Spice Girls imitation band, and that's what I think about some of the attempts at recreating. You cannot recreate it. Things have to live in their own. Things have to live on their own terms, and and there is enough there. There's enough there for people now who say enjoyed beating Italy in, in the European Championships. These are events in their own time. And these they, you, you can't just seek to benchmark everything by, by that experience. And don't forget, that was a gathering experience. So, so it was a bit of a roller coaster of, of, of a month Italia 90 was. But that whole eight years and, and moving on, 10 years really, of, or 10 years of Jack Charlton's reign, but the eight years from 88 to 2006 where there were and there was a really serious roller coaster there. Don't forget there was the failure to to qualify for 2002 uh, or for the 1992 European Championships, and then the 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 disappointment of the playoff against Holland in 1996 when an Ireland fielded a team of there must have been six fullbacks in in the team ultimately that that took the field that day. So it wasn't just one. It wasn't just sort of sort of Nirvana. For eight years, there were ups and downs during across those period, and but what the memory does is it collapses those bits that you want to remember into a kind of a, a highlights package, and mm. it appears as if everything was great. Well, that's just not the way it was. It's interesting then if you distill it down to sport and forget about everything outside of sport for the time being, because it has been said a lot over the last couple of days that the nineties were kind of the birth of a more colourful. GEA supporting fan base all around the country and then you had the advent of professionalism in rugby which sparked a greater interest in that game these are all a series of coincidences rather than being a spin-off of Italian 90 though aren't they well the world the world changes all the time the sporting world changes all the time and to understand one thing as the consequence of another requires a lot of leaps it's not to say they didn't feed off each other but people People had enjoyed going to Irish soccer matches before 1990. There was a long tradition, and by the way, there were there were there were people in in the 80s, in the late 80s and the early 90s, who kind of were almost um, there were almost expressed resentment at the idea that their team was now being opened up to everybody. Like they were kind of it was almost, and they were legitimately asking the question, "Where were you before the bandwagon when when we were here soldiering through this?" And in in, G, in GA terms. What transformed the GEA in the 1990s was the broadcast of matches on live television, a new marketing um, approach, which involved, say, for example, the Guinness sponsorship, which created new new ideas around it, the development of broader county-based sponsorship, which produced um, the remarkable feat of, of actually loads of people wearing county jerseys and the birth of a county jersey culture and, and, and all of that. And you're right, rugby... Rugby, rugby's professionalisation demanded that the sport push beyond its its narrow roots and actually develop uh, a num- a range of people who will now go to regularly to matches to help pay to help pay for players' wages. I think the coincidence is that money enters sports and the big brands realise that they can invest in this and get a massive return and, and own and stake out. Um, Sponsorship. If we can go back to the culture for a moment, because it, it feels sure. like so it has its poet laureate in uh, the Barrytown trilogy, which is they are essentially sports books. Well, certainly the van is a hundred percent a sports book. Um, oh, it's just a great book, though. It's a great. If, if anybody hasn't read the van, they should read the van. They oh, should read the trilogy. The, all three but of them are the sensational. Van, yeah, they're sensational books, and they're extremely funny. But it also, they're, they're, and they're a great celebration of a, of, of, a, of a culture. They are beautifully written in 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 a way that that kind of uh, that, that that is understated. And but they capture a period of a time with depth. It's not just it's not just throwaway lines. It's really carefully crafted, and it's 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 brilliant. I think they're works of resistance. I think they're works of of like they're they're representing a class that is 
socially, economically, culturally and spatially oppressed in like, you know, bad housing estates and no green fields. And I think that comes through when you read all the three books together. You can't but be thinking, geez, we didn't look after this portion of our population very well. But not to get sidetracked on that, we had the troubadour in uh, in Joxagosa Stuttgart, somebody chronicling yes. this and bringing this to... I, I do feel like there's a coming out of the working class in Ireland in a way that it, it brings working class culture mainstream. And I don't know if maybe that had already happened and I was, I was just living through this and understanding that, like, people who wouldn't normally speak to us, you know, the conversations were always about GEA. We were now talking about football. Like, somebody... I remember distinctly somebody coming home from the match in Stuttgart and giving me the hat that he was wearing and it was like, Oh, you like football. So this is another kind of... It, it, Michael D said it was an opening up of stuff, and it feels a little bit like that. I, you're, you're saying that maybe we're reading a bit too much into that. No, no, no. I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that it, there is an opening up, but, but just you have to be careful how you frame that opening up, in that there was parts of it open already, and it wasn't just one thing or another. That's, that's what I'm saying. There is no doubt that it spawned a culture around this, and it put, it put soccer on the front pages of of the Irish newspapers, and the Irish newspapers were massive in the 80s. It's not, it's not now we've been swamped by digital culture, but in, the, in, the, in that sense, the front page stories, day after day, the Evening Herald, the, the, the Irish Independent, and so on, they're, they were driven by soccer stories. And all the, look, look the weeks beforehand, before the, before, even before Italia 90, the number of supplements that were produced by newspapers, the ads on the radio. Uh, David Walsh, um, the journalist, was home... Uh, and took a taxi in from the airport to go to the gay, and he listened to the gay burn show, and some like two thirds of the ads on the gay burn show were about soccer. And this was this was um, the, the excitement that built around this, around this achievement of getting there, and around the team and the the, the love of that team. And I I I, I, I think I I do I, I do think you have to be careful though about saying that this is just. Um, like it's almost like a, a a cultural expedition of people into working class life and taking the bits that they want. Like people, people knew these players. Is it from not the other way around? Day. Is it not the other way around? Actually, that it, it's it's uh, working class heroes finally getting credit and and parity of esteem in in pockets where I don't think you know I I I don't know if Gabe Byrne had ever spoken about football. It'd be I'd be very interested to go back to the archives. But I'm sure he was by the time 88 came around, by the time 1990 came around. And I, I don't know how much the Irish Times, like they would have had Peter Byrne as their soccer correspondent, but I don't know if anybody else would ever have written about soccer in the Irish Times. I don't know, right? Um, like, yeah, no, soccer is covered in the Irish Times from, from the 1890s onwards. In the same um, kind in, of loving, reverential no, no, way that it happened no, in the not, 80s. But like, but like, let's be clear about it. GAA wasn't covered in the Irish Times for for in any meaningful way for for many of the decades of its time. Like the Irish Times, a rugby newspaper, a rugby and horse racing dominated and golf. So, but but I think your point stands that that it is it is a push of um, people from 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 a, a culture right into centre stage uh, in in a way that mattered. But but again, I'm 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 just saying that these things change as they go along and it wasn't just one moment. It's a series of moments over a period of eight years. I, I, the other thing, um I was looking up the title of it there, uh Dermot Bulger's in High Germany. I remember seeing that yeah. on T V. This is for people who are unfamiliar it's a, brilliant. Absolutely it, brilliant. Is it a one man I think it is a one man player. Maybe there's there's a, a, a character at the end. So it's a story essentially of an Irish emigrant who goes to the match in Stuttgart, and uh, it's his story, and it's it's about the decimation of emigration and how it kind of ruined Ireland for essentially since the famine. And finally, there's this big mad party in a field in Germany, and people are meeting up from generations and all around the world to come here to celebrate Ireland playing England, and then we beat them. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. It is, it, it is, again, a brilliant piece of work. Like, absolutely brilliant piece of work. And I, I, I think it's really interesting to look even at the Irish music charts from, 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 19, from, from the 1990s. Like, look at the start. Look at, take 1990, for example. The four soccer-related songs made number one in, 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 in that year. Um, I know you're going to talk to to Maya Brennan. But that, that was somewhat was it 13, 16 weeks as as number one. But before that, um, as as number one, 
you had Give It a Lash Jack with Liam Harrison and a kind of a cast of celebrities who did it for, for the Gold charity. You then, um, you had, by the way, there were other songs early in the year being dominated by Sinead O'Connor, Nothing Compares to You, and The Love Shack. Do you remember that song, The Love yeah. Shack? That, that, was, that was there as well. But after that, The Memories had a song called The Game, which um, was a list of kind of peak personalities of Irish soccer, not just present ones, but reaching back through Johnny Giles and into the history of soccer a little bit. And then finally, later in the year, um, there is uh, the Ua Paul McGrath song where um, Paul McGrath featured in the track. Paul McGrath is a lovely singer, by the way, um, and featured in the song. So four number ones. And that showed part of Ireland, but... Another song that was number one that year was was Mick Lally's song about Glen Row and being on the farm. And that was number one for a while. So it's a kind of country and Western tradition. And now <laughs> like this kind of push of soccer songs in to dominate the charts for the entirety of the, the second half of the year. The the game was the version of uh, We Didn't Start the Fire, isn't that it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, that's exactly right. Uh, Ua Paul McGrath featured Michelle Rocca, as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah. By the way, people can look, I don't know if people are interested in this, but there's a, there's a, there, if people are familiar with the amazing song, The Contender, the Jimmy McCarthy song, Paul McGrath has a version of that where he sings it, it's on YouTube, it's just, I, I just love it. You've obviously been immersing yourself in this because you've got a, an exhibition coming up in the Little Museum of Dublin. Research, Jar. it's research. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, what can we expect from that? And, and what, what have you found that has kind of... Um, I, look, I know you, you don't want anybody to put an easy narrative on it because, uh, again, that's kind of been the feature of the lecture series that you've been delivering um, and the history of Irish sport is that it's too easy for us to sit here now and go, well, everybody in 1990 didn't know anything about football. They switched the TV on, there was Sunny and Ireland were winning and we all had a massive party and the country got rich. And that's how the Celtic Tiger happened. Nice yes. little tidy narrative. We wrap it all up and we, we go. Yeah, here's a ball. Here you go. There's your sociological study of how soccer transformed Ireland and how soccer was transformed by Ireland and it doesn't hold water. Yeah. There's, there's definitely loads of little bits and, and threads of that that are, are very interesting to pull on. Like the point you make, absolutely. The, I'd say the ad industry probably comes into it, into into birth in Ireland. Before that, it was uh, GEA players and Ivermech, and then after that, at least there was a little bit of <laughs> central funding from Sony going, "Hey, there's a market over there for people buying videotapes because they all want to tape the Ireland matches. Maybe we should put a bit of funding into that." So I think there's probably loads of little bits that happened um, connected somehow to the football but not because of the football. But, but it's even, it, and it goes way beyond that, Jerry, as well. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, McCurtain's drapery uh, wishes the very best to the Irish soccer team and things. So you can see it in the local <laughs> papers. It, it's everywhere. It is basically the immersive. Soccer becomes part of advertising culture in a way. I mean, soccer had always been commercialised. There's not soccer being professionalised in Ireland in the 1890s. So it's not like there wasn't a commercial culture around it. But now it's mainstream, absolutely mainstream in how you sell goods. And, and maybe an appreciation that this demographic has some spending power. And I, yeah, exactly, exactly. And and this is one of the things, so in setting up this museum, uh, this exhibition with the Little Museum, it's it's opening on the 31st of, of July and it's been, a, it's been a great experience to, to, to go back and read all the stuff, to, to, to read the newspaper reports, to read the supplements. And people, people sent in um, some of the collections and we saw some of the... The memorabilia that was around and and um, and some of the stuff sur survives. Like I I love that flag, uh, squeal and mock and bubbling, and that's still that's still going. From people might remember that from 1990, and this massive flag that was passed through the through the crowd. But there's everything from well, I won't tell you everything is, but there's obviously t-shirts and milk bottles and photographs, original photographs, postcards sent home, and the works, um, all wrapped into it. And what we try to do is tell the history of Irish soccer in the run up to 1990 and then talk about how that had a transformative um, effect on people's lives during that year and then try and tease out its legacy. And there's a really contested legacy here because some people will say the legacy was a transformation of Irish soccer. Well, I'm not entirely sure about that. Okay. I'm not too sure. Hold on, that, hold that that talk, I, I want to get into the legacy in just a minute. I'll tell everybody here, it's 9.42 a.m. We're talking with Professor Paul Rice talking about the cultural impact on, uh, of Jack Charlton's Ireland and the legacy is, is what we're going to talk about next. OTB AM is live this morning in association with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Why is the legacy so contested, Paul? Well, w w what, if you think about it, th did it give a boost to organised soccer in the country? And if it did, in what way did did it do so? So it's it's 
clear that it did nothing in any meaningful way in the longer term for organised elite soccer in Ireland, for, for the League of Ireland, which continued to struggle and, and, and those struggles uh, continue. What it did do, I think, though, was create a broader group of people who are now interested and able to play soccer on a regular basis. But that also was the product of the transformation of leisure facilities through the building of five-a-side pitches and everything that goes around that. So it's not that people... I mean, every kid who grew up in Ireland who was interested in sport at some point, regardless of what part of the country they were, played a little bit of soccer amongst themselves. They may not have played in a formally organised way, but they played it somewhere. But you have the pushing of a lot of those games into five-a-side pitches for people who managed to keep playing into their 20s and beyond uh, is, is one of the features, I think, of, of what, what happened from 1990 onwards. But I think its greatest legacy is it set the bar for qualification campaigns in that anything less now than qualification, you know, the, it, it was measured against that, that success. Cause, so this was now achievable. This was not a faraway dream. This was something that people did and getting to the quarterfinal had happened. So that's the bar. Essentially, the issue of them not being able to capitalise on it was because the FAI was a ramshackle organisation. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't fit for purpose. It, it's, the, the real, we have to call it straight out here. Look, the reality of it is it hasn't been fit for purpose. It hasn't managed to marry it, the, the, the global game, this, the most successful game in the world, in the history of the world, the richest game in the world. And it hasn't managed to, to um, channel that in a domestic setting. And there's no sign of it happening anytime soon. There's already a, a, a reports in the papers today of, um, of war. I, I want to play... Institutional change is hard, though. That's the only thing I'll say on that. Institutional change is hard, and it takes a long time. And I think it'll be really interesting to see where the FAI are in three years' time. I, I mean, we, we've got to get to Moya Brennan, but um, like around this time, the GAA was changing institutionally and, and becoming forward-thinking and building the stadium and preparing itself for the boom in, in sport that was coming. Um, and the, the boom in sponsorship. So, um... Yeah, it's the late 80s. The GEA started to go and look at Stadia abroad in the late 80s, going around looking at the Sky Dome in Toronto and all of that. And they, they, built, uh, they, they, they rebuilt Croke Park from planning from the late 80s onwards. And that, I think, was an engine which drove the transformation of the imagery of the GEA, at least, including sponsorship and live television and, and everything that comes from that. And I think it should be seen in, in, in parallel with Italia 90, not, not as a consequence of it. Yeah, totally. And, and even the self-image of how they spoke about the stadium, one of the best stadiums in the world, one of the best stands in the world, look at this. Like, that, that kind of... Um, that language is very powerful and it's, it's seductive to, to people as well. Like, are you going to spend your time with this organisation? Yeah, we are, because they, they keep doing this stuff. And, you know, it was a, a, an intoxicating mix. Uh, 87 9180 is the number. Paul's going to stay with us and we're going to speak with Moy Brennan in just a moment about Put Him Under Pressure, which I think had um, a long time at number one and certainly months and months in the charts. Let's hear first, though, from Mick McCarthy here and his memories of Jack Tarleton.